Okay, so I am trying to figure out, so you all can see me. I can't see what you all see at the moment because it's slightly delayed. Um, so I'm gonna turn that off so that I'm not distracted. Um, so I assume, please confirm for me, uh, that Scott and David and Luke have all joined us. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Hey, hello everyone. So uh, good afternoon for most of you. Um, good morning for some of the rest of you who, are, who like me, are in the US-based uh, time zone, uh, particularly if you're a speaker who got up at the crack of dawn to join us um, to share your knowledge with the EMEA, you know, with the Europe, um, UK EMEA folks. Uh, I, I and WeWorks, we all very much appreciate that. Um, I did get up early enough to see all of your talks, and so I found them all extremely fascinating. And I will encourage the audience to please do go into the Get Up Stay Slack channel and pose your questions there. Um, those of you who know me know that I am never at a loss for questions, so I've got plenty of questions. Um, uh, but uh, we would like to invite the audience to do that as well. So um, to kind of get started, I'm gonna start with you, David, um, because I'm gonna just, it's a little too early for me to do anything other than chronological at the moment, but we'll maybe get a little bit more dynamic as we go. Um, I found your, your talk to be really fantastic. I personally spend a lot of time in the DevOps community myself. I spent you know, seven or more years at Pivotal where we spent just as much time talking about the people elements as we did the technology. Um, and I love, you know, if, if I were to summarize um, kind of in a nutshell, what you were telling us, sharing with us was a way of helping folks understand and not just understand, but get excited about something new. And so here, the new thing that we're talking about, of course, is GitOps. And, you know, the traditional way, I have enough gray hair that, you know, the old way we used to do this is we used to have some, you know, ivory tower, which would say, here's the way that thou shalt do things. And you described a very, very different process. We know that that doesn't work. Um, and to sum it up, I think that the three things that I took away from it was vulnerability, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that seemed like a very powerful thing. Safety nets that are going to allow people to be vulnerable, um, both the people who are starting and the people who, are, who you're trying to bring along. And I love this idea of ambassadors. And I love how you put that all together and said, you know, these are elements, these are the ingredients that will build a cult. Now, here's my question. I'm a techie, I'm a propeller head. And when we talk about GitOps and we talk about starting things from a technology perspective, there is this process at the beginning that I call bootstrapping. So there's always this bootstrap, like how do you bootstrap the GitOps runtime? Um, and that's something that Flux2 does really well. There's actually a, right. a Flux bootstrap command. But I wanna take it back to the topic that you were talking about, which is you talked about these three elements. What did the bootstrapping look like? I mean, where did you start? Oh man, um, that's a good question. So in, in the, in, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about um, where I currently am on how we bootstrapped it um, just for uh, brevity's sake. But what we did was we, um, basically bootstrapped it secretly behind the, the scenes and set it up um, and didn't really um, push it on people. And instead what we did was we kind of um, tricked them almost into using it, uh, which we would, we would walk people through the process of, you know, this is how it's happening. Oh, and here's this thing flux and here's what this does. And we positioned it from a standpoint of, isn't it great to see your work immediately reflected in this test cluster, right? We had um, a, a something I, I didn't have time to put into the talk was we had a tools cluster, um, which had all of the bells and whistles that we wanted to deploy involved in it, but it, there was nothing production in there, right? And so what we allowed people to do was, hey, if you are looking at 
um, deploying this. Well, our pipeline is this GitOps process. And you can monkey around over here just with no problems. There's like, um, there's no possibility of you blowing something up. You could take out the whole cluster and nothing bad will happen. And that reassurance of you really don't need to worry about anything really helped um, people get involved. Um, and uh, that was something that I was really happy about rolling out because I always considered, you know, what, what makes me anxious about getting involved in something new, right? Um, and like I, like I said, one of the toxic characteristics was being seen failing. Switching that to failing is expected and totally fine, especially when it's in the tools area, um, got people involved very quickly. And when they got to do it themselves, you know, um, and go through the whole process with help, you know, like, like, I, like I said, we, we paired with them a lot. They were able to really naturally go through that process without having to deal with any bootstrapping. Because by the time it came time for their project to incorporate it, they already knew how it worked and they were comfortable with it. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I one of the things I think is really key is that fear is the thing that blocks people from doing things differently. And so you've done this masterful job of helping people feel, I mean, the, the, the word du jour is, or words du jour are psychological <laughs> safety. Yeah. Um, and so you've really done a masterful job there. Thank you for that. Um, Luke, I, I have a couple of questions that I want to turn to you on. Um, and that is, uh, is I loved, by the way, your, what I, I like to use is the term calculus of. Um, as a mathematician, <laughs> computer scientist, I, I'm used to thinking in terms of equations. And yeah. then I sometimes say that when we get over to things like people management, it's all this fuzzy thing. But I've learned over the years <laughs> that you can actually come up with a calculus of anything. Um, and that coming up with that calculus helps us make things more concrete. And so your two equations of software equals, you know, is a, is a compilation of code and environment, and then making it very, very clear that you've got these other things when you're in the ML ops space. I really have two questions. Um, I think the first one you started to answer, which is, um, do ML, you, you, you demonstrated the need for tracking these things. And that's certainly yeah. part of what we do with GitOps is tracking. And I, I'm only vaguely familiar. I know Jupyter Notebooks, the way that I've always heard them talk about is as a collaboration tool. Hmm. Does it also act as a, as a part of the tracking system or is there something else? So Jupyter Notebooks are, are a really interesting um, uh, thing because they can make it easier for people to share their working. And it, Jupyter Notebooks are a wonderful tool for um, kind of doing exploratory data analysis and like trying out training a model. Um, but they're actually a really bad tool for building production pipelines. Um, and um, yeah, so while you can kind of build a Jupyter Notebook and you can put code and documentation and results like visual representations of, of results and you can interleave them in a really nice document um, with a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, they, they work really badly in Git because a Jupyter Notebook is actually a JSON object and JSON objects when you put them in Git, um, uh, they are really hard to collaborate with, uh, collaborate on because you can't diff and merge them in a sensible way. And there are efforts to, to try and solve that but um, but none of them are really uh, complete. And actually collaboration on Jupyter Notebooks is harder than collaboration on version controlled Python scripts, for example, uh, uh, right now. So um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but it's, it's certainly one of the challenges it, it around does. Jupyter. Yeah. And, and so it does kind of confirm that it's a better tool for collaboration. It also strikes me when I think about it, I've played a little bit with it, that it's this mm -hmm. highly imperative, you know, it, 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 it isn't declarative at all. And so um, you did yep. just say that, you know, there's other scripts that are non-declarative that are easier to do. So there's even more challenges, but um, yeah, and that I definitely think, uh, helps. As, as a follow-up to that, um, it's worth thinking about the roles of the people involved in doing the work. Um, and there's this kind of DevOps was all about breaking down silos between developers and operations people. 
Uh, there's a new silo in MLOps between the researchers and the um, uh, ML engineers. Um, because the researchers are often using Jupyter notebooks, which are very imperative, they're exploratory, and often the results of the Jupyter notebooks are human knowledge, not like deployable artifacts. Um, and uh, they often then throw their Jupyter notebooks over the wall to someone with a role like data engineer or machine learning engineer, who rewrite that the, the essential parts of that Jupyter notebook as uh, pipelines, data pipelines, or, or version controlled. Um, uh, pipelines that yes um, that, that then can they're more amenable to to GitOps, but I think there's a big gap between um, yeah the, uh, the that kind of uh, early research world which is very imperative and notebook driven, and then the closer to production world which is around pipelines and um, version controlled code. <laughs> Yeah, very good. Um, I had another question, but I'm actually going to go to the Slack channel because we have one there, oh. which is um, uh, ML ops question. With systems mm -hmm. like Kubeflow and Pachyderm, there's a steep learning curve to learn tools like Docker, Amazon S3, Kubernetes, lots of YAML, etc. Yeah. For a data scientist, where do you see the workflow changing to lower this learning curve or lower this barrier of entry, especially mm -hmm. that data scientists are used to Jupyter Notebooks, the very thing we yeah. were just talking about as their point of reference? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's a really interesting question. I think um, I think it's a wide open space, and I think that the that it's it's an early space where. Um, new companies and, and organizations can come and bring tools that, that help ease that, um, that transition from research and prototyping to, to production, uh, especially around data pipelines and model training. Um, I've seen some early efforts around, the, there's, de there's generally two different approaches that I've seen, which is some, some companies um, are trying to make, um, they're kind of trying to productionize notebooks and make it possible to define um, a an ML pipeline from inside a notebook um, somehow, either by like automatically running notebooks uh, as part of a pipeline, um, or by using like a Python SDK inside a notebook to define a pipeline that then gets pushed into some other system, uh, like Kubeflow pipelines, for example, um, and and there are things like the Kubeflow pipelines. Um, uh, SDK, which allows you to, um, it's kind of funky. You can um, uh, you can define a Python function inside your Jupyter notebook, and then say this Python function should be part of this production pipeline. Um, and the compiler that compiles that uh, into um, underlying Argo workflow uh, CRDs in Kubernetes. Uh, attaches the it, it uses Python introspection to attach the body of that function um, as an annotation on the Kubernetes object, <laughs> which then gets run in production, which is bonkers um, if you think about it. But um, but yeah, there's uh, there's approaches like that. Um, they they oh. suffer a little bit from usability, I think. Um, but that's that's one approach. And then the other approach is trying to make kind of proper version controlled um, pipelines more accessible to data scientists. And reducing the number of steps that you need, like Docker and object storage and Kubernetes, and I completely agree, it should be possible for data scientists to to build and deploy production pipelines without having to understand all of the DevOps complexity. I hope yeah, that answers great. the question. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, all right, Scott. Um, one of the first things I want to do is gush a little bit because you did something really interesting. Um, when you were talking about a number of things, but you brought up this notion of retries. Now, retries, of course, is a key pattern in cloud native software architecture. So we know that we aren't gonna make a single request to something, and if we don't hear back, we give up. Well, we try, we retry. But what you did was you took this kind of key pattern of retries, and a retry is basically a redundancy pattern. Hmm. And you introduced that retry into ops so there's this retry pattern that is very um important with and i'm i'm about to talk talk a little bit more about GitOps patterns and so i had this like aha moment 
But I do have a concrete question, I, and, and you can certainly comment on that as well. Um, when you were talking about observability, uh, it tor you know, toward the end when you were ha had actually brought things together, you talked about Prometheus and Helm. And um, I think you alluded to it, but I wonder if you can expand a little bit on this notion of uh, is, did Helm, does Helm do anything natively with, with Prometheus? Is, is Helm itself Prometheus aware? Or is it specifically the GitOps things that we're putting in place that links these, that integrates these two things? Because really we can sometimes think of GitOps as an integration layer between different components. So. Uh, so the answer is yes. <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> in general, it, it, so many Helm charts have Prometheus um, integration built into them, just because it's a very it's a very commonly requested feature. Um, and I didn't really talk about some of the new features in in, in Helm three yet, um, but there is I can just briefly mention without getting into the details of that now, because we can do that tomorrow. But there is a feature as of Helm uh, v3.1.0 that allows you to introduce <clears throat> new templating or new value, new uh, um, annotations or whatever else you might want, even into charts that don't have that functionality built into it. So, so on the application level, there's integration with uh, Prometheus generally, one way or the other, whether it's already in the chart or whether you want to add use Helm's post renderer to add that to any existing chart. Um, and you can anybody interested in that can look that up later or join tomorrow. But um, but to your I think to your main point, uh, for beyond the application la layer, for the ops layer, the answer is no. <laughs> the answer is no, Helm does not have any specific relationship to that. Helm at this point is a client. Um, how you set it up how, a, how a, an operations team sets it up, I mean, or a, or a DevOps team sets that up, um, it, that is the only way that uh, anything related to, to Helm's operations will be, uh, will we'll send data to Prometheus. So, so that, that's why I just said yes at first, because it is in fact the GitOps layer that adds, uh, that really integrates um, information about what's happening with the Helm releases themselves with, with uh, data aggregation or with other telemetry projects. Because ultimately, generally, let's say if you're a human operator and you're running the Helm client, any standard, in, st excuse me, any standard output or standard errors that you get, um, any sort of feedback you get from the Helm client, you just get on your own in your own terminal. It doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> you know, and, and if you're in a CI system, um, you have to integrate that kind of information uh, as well. So if there are if there's specific data you want from that uh, specific telemetry, then you have to figure out how to where to send that. Um, whereas with Flux, all the information that uh, and I'm only mentioning Flux GitOps right now because I know um, other GitOps tools may not all do this. Um, some may do some of this. But I know with Flux, uh, that information is sent directly to those um, uh, custom resource, those custom resources that power the Flux GitOps. Um, and so all of that information is all in Kubernetes. So if you have that, if users have that set up already to send that information out, it's just all built in. Okay. And I think one of the things that your answer just clarified again is, but I think it's worth you know saying directly is that Prometheus is used to monitor a number of different things at different layers. And so when you describe the Prometheus that was baked into the Helm chart, that's more around the, the, it's probably more around the monitoring of the workload itself that Helm is packaging, not around the operations of that workload. Yes. And so what you were talking about was that the GitOps and Flux allows us to really get gain that visibility and. In, and in a sensible way across the, the operations of that, that workload. Yes. Yeah. That's a good way awesome. to put it. Excellent. Well, um, thank you, David, Luke, and Scott. Thank you so much for joining us during this Q&A and for joining us for your talks as well. Um, I look forward to uh, catching up with all of you more as we go offline. So thank you all. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.
拜。